Welcome to Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio coverage of the National Conference on Philanthropic Planning. We're on the Riverwalk in San Antonio, Texas. The topic right now is Accept Real Estate Gifts! Exclamation mark. And my guests are Chase Magnuson and Alan Thomas. Chase is Director of Gift Planning for Real Estate at the George Washington University. And Alan Thomas is Vice President of Advancement for the American College in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to be here with you. Pleasure to have both of you. You have an exclamation mark after re- accept real estate gifts. Chase, why is that? Why is this so important? Well, it's important because it's one of the largest equity opportunities for both the donors to become philanthropists as well as the charities to benefit from their gifts of real estate. And historically, charities have been either rejecting or not accepting real estate gifts. And I think Alan and I are bringing some pretty good reasons why organizations ought to consider real estate gifts in addition with some wonderful solutions. I uh, I think accepting real estate gifts is a uh, wonderful topic name, but I would make it even more emphatic and just say take real estate, take uh, any kind of real estate. Okay, w- what's the reluctance been, Chase? Why, why have we seen that? The expertise of the organizations doesn't lend itself well to the real estate industry. Uh, They are two separate disciplines, and they haven't put together teams of experts to help solve problems. And there is a great fear of uh, liability that comes with the ownership of real estate. And I think some some of the issues that Alan and I are going to be covering today would uh, help solve those problems. Help reduce the risk, because there is risk, uh, right? And But we can minimize we can it, minim- is that right? Yes, indeed we can. Okay. Um, Alan, let's turn to you and, and think about um, how we start to talk to donors. How do we start to cultivate them around thinking about a real estate gift? Tony, great question. We, um, uh, we need to uh, encourage the charities to uh, reach out to the real estate community uh, in order to promote real, so, est- real estate gifts. So real estate professionals? Uh, real estate brokers, professionals. Brokers, attorneys, what, what do you absolutely. mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, real estate brokers, attorneys, and financial advisors um, who represent um, uh, potential donors as well. Okay. And we need to get this message out that charities um, are willing to accept real estate and that there are advantages to um, their donors to, uh, to make these gifts to charities. And there are very wonderful... Uh, mechanisms um, that will um, promote this and make this viable for both the donor and the charity. Okay, uh, it's, what are, uh, it's yeah. actually the charities have been standing in the door, rejecting gifts that uh, donors very generously have come to the table with, because the charities are not set up to handle it. Over 80 percent of all gifts from donors offered to charities are rejected out of hand. Real which estate is, gifts. Yes. Yeah. And the and the best. We can calculate the amount of uh, real estate that's rejected every year is between 16 and 20 billion dollars. That could be coming to charities, at least some portion of that, if the charities would go to the trouble of putting together uh, teams of of experts to help them manage the process. So it is such a wonderfully uh, a wonderful opportunity for an untapped market to really spur on the the charities in a very difficult time in fundraising. All right, so let's pursue that. What what does the charity need to have in place, Chase? They need to have policies and procedures internally. They need to have a committee of people who make decisions. The plan giving officer, who is the front line agent for the charities, have to have a, a working knowledge of the types of real estate gifts and how they can be used. And, and here at, at uh, this conference, I would venture to say 95 to 98 percent of all the plan giving officers understand the technical side of it, but they need uh, they need residential real estate agents for for personal residents. They need commercial brokers for investment properties, farm and ranch brokers who specialize in another area, and industrial brokers for corporate gifts of surplus real estate. It really it really covers a gamut of about 26 real estate specialties, and no one person can have all of that kind of expertise by themselves. So this may not be appropriate then for the smallest, uh, some of the smaller or smaller charities oh on, on the contrary they oh, okay. ought to team up with a larger better uh, position charity to share in the gift oh okay let's talk about that then so what can the small and mid-sized shops do that that 
don't have the the board or or the wherewithal to to hire this expertise? What 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 can the small, small Tony, shop do? Tony, the small charity can partner with a larger charity, and that has the expertise and has those contacts and the team sort of driven approach to accepting real estate, and they can partner and split the proceeds. Um, between when a, when a property is sold, okay. So there are ways of partnering and 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 helping those smaller charities. Our message today to this this universe um, of folks here at, at uh, the Plan Giving Conference is to help them understand that there are mechanisms and ways in which to accept real estate that will insulate them from the risk that may be inherent. And they're all, of course, skeptical about. Uh, the real estate market today, and we need to assure them that there are ways of underwriting uh, acceptance of gifts uh, that should be acceptable to their boards uh, and, and and make them comfortable with All it. All right, and we'll, we'll have time to get to some of those. Yeah, go ahead, Chase. Looks I like was, you have something. I was going to say that the small charities, by teaming up with a larger charity, um, don't expose themselves to cost of managing a process or hiring new people and it can move very very smoothly through the process but what what professionals like Alan bring to the table is they've actually closed major real estate gifts what we hear at these conferences frankly are quite often just theories on how it's going to be done so for for practitioners who have closed multiple transactions on all kinds of properties, you're looking at one of somebody that's very unique and you know, okay. and, and okay. chase chase but, the two of us. All right, we're all admiring each other. All right. <laughs> well, no, and I, I admire your pinstripe suits. No, but it yeah. but it needs to be it needs to be okay. heard out there that somebody's actually doing it rather than just theory on a piece of paper. It can be done. Well, and and your title is director of gift planning for real estate. So I imagine you're working. I mean, you're right. not just sitting back. You're you're earning your keep. I'd like to get a copy of at, that to at my George Washington. Uni- I'll get a copy of this for my university right. so they recognize it. Chase earns his keep. <laughs> exclamation mark. With exclamation mark. Three of them. Okay. Um, now, but I want to so I want to pursue this a little more. So a small charity, someone comes to them with the idea of a real estate gift, wouldn't that charity be reluctant to go to another uh, another charity and partner for fear of losing the donor relationship, Alan? Well, the important thing is that that small charity needs to still be the primary contact with that donor, and they need to be um, assured that they will be in the uh, having that principal dialogue, uh, bringing the larger charity in as as an advisor and uh, able to help guide the process. Um, Chase and I talk about process because you need an infrastructure Mm -hmm. uh, in place and a process in order to be able to accept real estate gifts. If you don't have that infrastructure and process, you're going to be flailing away and and in all likelihood probably not accepting not real estate gifts when they falling become available. The, falling into the 80% or, so, or 90% yes, exactly. that Chase mentioned. And exactly. I, I would go in another direction for the small charity that's looking at a million dollar gift and they're not capable of handling it. How dangerous does it have to be for them to lose their donor if the if the property is handled with a sister corporation and they get five hundred thousand dollars of the gift they get zero or they get five hundred thousand dollars that doesn't seem to be to be a very hard business decision for the small charity and whoever they're teaming up with they've already vetted them and they know who they're dealing with we all live in a very small community known as a nonprofit world, and you simply cannot afford to to go against what you've told another charity you'll do. And we really go out and say to the small charity, we're not going to invade your relationship with your donor. This is a one-off transaction that we might help with. Have, have you partnered, partnered at George Washington with small charities? Not yet, but I've done it in my prior career, and we are establishing ourselves to do exactly that. Okay, oh, so are you reaching out to the nonprofit community in, Absolutely. in the D.C. We're area? Here, yeah. We're here, well... Across the country. Uh, nationally? Okay. Yeah, and, and I think Alan th- would do the th- same and thing. And that will be part of our message today as well, yes. yes okay. Tony. Uh, and so, and it need not be in your uh, in your respective cities, the, 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 part, the partner not. charity. No, the, our, our, our efforts are national in scope, and, 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 and so is in Chase's. We, we will look at real estate gifts all over the United States. Okay. Well, Chase, go I, ahead. We're yeah. actually intergalactic. <laughs> <laughs> So, with a word like intergalactic, you don't need an exclamation mark. Yeah, absolutely no, no not. I think that carries the day. No punctuation it? required. The word, <laughs> ha, word is is resounding in its own. A, a period, even a semicolon uh, would be no, sufficient. No, that's that. okay. that overdoes it. Okay, no, but all right, I think it's important for the audience of this show is small and mid-sized 
nonprofits. I think it's important for them to know that that both of your institutions are interested in talking to small or shops that that may be offered a real estate gift and don't have the wherewithal to manage it themselves. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I, w- okay. I would like to okay. b- I characterize us as mentors. Once we teach the smaller charity how to do it, we'll step away and they never have to share again. Okay. But they can also use community foundations and other charities in their community that the donor might want to have an interest in rather than coming to a George Washington University. All right. Um, Alan, you talked a little about um, cultivation, you, you, uh, starting to cultivate the gifts through the, the advisors, but I, I really should have started with identifying. Let, let's, uh, Alan, let's identify the right donors to be proactively recommending or, or promoting the idea of real estate gifts. How do we identify the, the right group to, to promote these ideas to? Well, in any kind of planned giving situation, the, the best donor that you're going to have for your charity um, is one who has been um, involved in your charity in the past, uh, who has a strong affinity to your, your mission, and, um, and has been a, a past giver. So, first of all, you look at somebody who um, is invested in your charity already uh, and would be the most likely prospect for a planned gift of any kind, and then you would want to uh, sort of um, identify those who in particular might have real estate assets um, above and beyond um, the average kind of donor and who might be a, a very good prospect. Um, so that takes the time to uh, cultivate your plan giving donors and understand um, who those best ones are for real estate gifts. And what type of real estate might they need to have? I mean, suppose they just have a primary home. Could, could, could the type of donor that you described be a candidate for the type of gifts we're talking about with just a primary home? Yes, Tony. The very first example we will give in our presentation today um, is called a retained life estate. And that is a gift where a donor gives uh, their residence, it could be a primary residence or a vacation home or a ranch, that they give it to a charity and they retain a life estate to remain there through the balance of, of their lives. On Tony Martinetti Nonprofit Radio, we have Jargon Jail. Um, I, I work in plan giving. I know what you mean, but let's talk about life estate. What, uh, I want to keep you out of jargon jail, because okay. otherwise I'll throw you in. Pin, okay. Pinstripe soup and all. doesn't oh, matter. He can, all right. he can handle right it. He's not <laughs> afraid of you, Tony. He'll come get you. Uh, what, is, what is a life estate that a the life donor est- is retaining? A, a life estate is when you reserve the right to stay in that property uh, through the duration of your lifetime. And it could be one person or, or joint people. Uh, it could be more than one. Okay. So um, if you have a husband and wife who are 75, 76, and they they love your charity, they want to give their primary home to you, and they want to stay in that property for the balance of their lives. They transfer the deed to your charity and and reserve this life tenancy to remain in that property uh, for the rest of their lives. So then when one of them, when the first of them dies, the survivor continues to live there? Yes. And then at the survivor's death, what, what happens to the property? Uh, then the charity has complete control over it. Okay. Because it is a new deed. Is that right? The, uh, this the, is the, the deed is transferred to the charity when uh, the retained life estate is created. Right. That's what I meant. At, at, at its creation, we're, we're writing a new deed. Yes. Where the donor keeps the life residence, life yes. estate, and could be for more than one life, and then at their death transfer to the charity. Yes. And Go ahead, have, cha- uh, there there choice. are two other benefits. Should the donors decide they want to move out of the home into a, assisted living, they can rent the property and get the rental income. Or they can sell the balance of their life estate to the charity for a lump sum. So it's sort of like a spigot for additional income for the donor. It's wonderfully flexible. Okay. It is wonderfully flexible. Yes. I, I'd, I'd d- like to come. I'd like to come in a different direction. Alan's giving you the tra- Alan's giving you the traditional explanation on how you manage and cultivate. Mm-hmm. But we are also problem solvers. We often get donors that come to us that say we're tired of managing our property. We need income. We could use some tax shelter. Here's our property. Give us the alternatives. So we're like, um, we are really uh, weaving a mosaic on different opportunities for lifetime income, tax shelter, and to solve the property management issue. So we're problem solvers at the same time we're cultivating the relationship. Excellent it's point. A wonderful, it's a wonderful role to play. It is. The, um, the retained life estate, so we, we've been using the example singularly, we've just been saying at the death of the, the, 
donors, uh, donor or donors. Second to, to die. To, to, the re remainder is to the charity, but this can be done for multiple charities. Then, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. And how how would the charities then work together when the property is transferred to them at the death of the survivor? There would be a primary charity that would take title to the property with the responsibilities to make sure it's maintained, that it's insured, and that sort of thing, and then an interlocking agreement with the donors and the other charities on how the eventual proceeds will be divided. Okay. Very so simple. It's all worked out during yes. the, while the donors are living, so they know how the proceeds will be distributed across the charities. Yes. yes. And, and it becomes very much like a, um, a landlord-tenant kind of situation because your donors remain there um, uh, living in the property, um, caring for it as they have been. So it, it's like a landlord-tenant situation. And, and, Alan, who's responsible for the expenses while the donors are, are living there? We typically look to have the donor take care of the expenses, the uh, maintenance, the real estate taxes, the insurance, um, and uh, so that uh, the charity doesn't have to um, uh, make those expenditures. Okay. And we, we, we make site inspections because we are the stewards for the organizations that are getting the proceeds to make sure our asset is well taken care of. So how often is there a site visit? At least uh, annually. Yes, annually. Okay. Um, and what if the donor, Chase, would like to make uh, improvements or renovations or uh, to, the, to the property? Do they need to get the permission of the charities? How does that work? Yes, that is that is in the original contract for donation because additions to properties in the eye of the beholder may change the value, hurt it, or do something else because Uncle Fred came in and decided to put a carport in, but he's not a contractor, and <laughs> when you go look at it, the carport's on the wrong property, and here comes the litigation. Okay, so there, there does have to be we prior We have the right. For, yeah, yes. okay. okay. All right, so following our course, we talked about identifying the right donors and cultivating. Chase, let's continue with um, how do you open this conversation with uh, with with people who you think are good prospects for uh, the retained life estate that we're talking about? Well, I, I think that, that there are some qualifiers such as their age. You've, you wouldn't open this conversation without having several donor meetings. To f you ask the question, what are you trying to accomplish? And it's from that point that we move forward. We can eliminate many alternatives in the gifting program of real estate because we've heard the donors are going in a different direction. If, if things like we want to live out our lives here in comfort, that is the first kickoff to say, Look, you can get some tax deduction. You can become your legacy can be turned into a current philanthropic recognized gift, mm -hmm. and you can stay here, and we'll help you do that. That's an easy conversation. You often meet the donors at their home, and you can look around. You know an awful lot about about your di your donor base. So um, I don't, Alan. Do you have a? If Alan's probably got a key question when he comes in the door, where's the deed? All right, well, now you set him up. <laughs> now, now he better have one because you've set him up. Or go ahead. I gave him Alan, enough you... time anyway. <laughs> Uh, Alan, do you like to add more to opening that conversation? I, I would like to add uh, an additional part of the conversation, and that is that this is a holistic discussion that goes way beyond just the real estate. You need to know um, your donors in this situation because, for instance, you don't want to take a retained life estate if that's their single asset or predominantly their asset and they don't have any other um, income or assets in order to meet their future um, okay. Living, living uh, needs, their medical needs, um, and you don't want to find yourself in a situation where they need that the uh, the worth of that real estate in order to cover their future needs. So that that that's an additional part of the discussion, um, which goes beyond just the real estate. So um, we as plan giving people uh, need to have a, a complete broader um, uh, perspective on uh, what that donor's situation is. So it's very important. It's all about the donors. Donor centric, donor centered. Yes, We've been saying absolutely. that for, for a long time. All about the donors. Okay. Um, all right. So then, um, Alan, let's continue. We we opened the conversation. The person is willing to hear a little more. Um, do we start to bring in their advisors, their family? What what's sort of the next step? Maybe the the second or third meeting about this topic. We absolutely need to bring in their advisors, and we highly recommend bringing in family. 
the last thing you want is family to be surprised uh, when uh, when mom and dad have all of a sudden announced to them, gee, I gave the homestead to uh, XYZ Charity and uh, we're going to stay here for the rest of our lives, but uh, it's gone. So uh, you don't want... Um, a direct uh, close family to be surprised in those situations. So you want the advisor, the family, and we need to bring in our uh, uh, expertise with um, uh, appraisers and uh, um, conduct our due diligence to make sure that the property uh, is valued correctly and that there aren't any um, unsuspected sort of uh, liabilities associated with it. Okay, and I'm hoping we have a, a minute or so to get into some of what some of that due diligence is, but Chase, let me ask you, who, who might some of these experts, or I should say, donors advisors be that we're, we're, we're asking the donors to bring into the conversation? Uh, in addition to their own um, family attorney, they ought to be talking to a specialist in wills and estates. They ought to be talking to a CPA that would work closely with that professional. The plan giving person should be uh, eventually brought in on a three or four way conversation and then depending on the type of property uh, the plan giving officer would reach out to a real estate specialist on on that particular kind of property to get an evaluation, just a range of values, because some donors think their property's worth a million and it may only be worth, not to say only, but it could be worth 600000 so mm -hmm. expectations have to be matched, and that's what Alan was talking about. This is a process. You don't do it in one setting. You work through it and that sort of thing, so everybody needs to be on at least the same page on what is the value of the asset we're going to talk about today, and how do you want to use that, and do you want to share that between our organization and others that you have historically um, given money to, and you can do that all in one package, and we're here to help. Okay. Uh, we have just about a minute left, gentlemen. Alan, let's talk a little about the, the due diligence. What what does the, do the charity or charities working together need to do to make sure that this is an appropriate gift for them to accept? Chase and I have forms that we've actually developed a uh, form for the donor to uh, answer um, three or four pages of questions uh, and then we have our own donor uh, our own checklist for uh, ensuring that we've covered all the issues that uh, zoning issues title issues environmental issues um, having an environmental phase one um, a study done um, these are all things that need to be uh, conducted in order to know that you're getting a property uh, that you're comfortable with and you know is free of liability and is going to be worth um, what you're representing to your charity. The last thing you want to do is accept a piece of real estate um, that later your board finds out has a valuation uh, drastically different than what you've represented and oh by the way um, there's some sort of environmental issue uh, related there as well. So. Um, uh, that's part of the due diligence. And that brings us really full circle in terms of minimizing the risk. Th there are potential risks, but we can work in partner with other charities to minimize those risks. We've been talking about accept real estate gifts, exclamation mark, with uh, Chase Magnuson, Director of Gift Planning for Real Estate at the George Washington University, and Alan Thomas, Vice President of Advancement at the American College, Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, I want to thank you very much. Thank Tony, you. thank you so much. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. I enjoyed it as well. This thank is Tony you. Martinetti nonprofit radio coverage of the National Conference on Philanthropic Planning in San Antonio, Texas.